It's a great pleasure for me now to introduce to you somebody who you already know through the email contact that I, uh, without doubt, know you have had over the year as you've prepared to come to this event, to Dr. Crystal von Holt. Crystal served as head of the German Institute for Youth and Society. She's a pediatrician by profession and served in Germany and briefly in India and in South Africa. She now serves as the vice or really co-chair of the International Federation of Therapeutic and Counseling Choice. Please would you welcome Dr. Crystal von Holt. A very warm welcome to you all, to everybody of you. I'm glad that we are here together. The number of people who identify as transgender is rapidly increasing. Transgender is a psychological condition in which, for example, a boy wants to be a girl or a girl wants to be a boy. In most cases, these feelings dissolve on their own once the child is grown up. Besides, we know that counseling, family therapy, psychotherapy can help many of these troubled children to be reconciled with the reality of their body. But what about adults? I'm going to present the history of two women who both suffered from a severe transgender problem in childhood and in adulthood. I have known them very well for many years and have been in regular contact with them up until now. And I want to thank them for allowing me to present main aspects of their life stories here. I changed their names as well as some small biographical details. Anna, not her real name, was born in Western Europe and when grown up moved to Germany. She is now 48 years old. Anna is the eldest of two daughters. Her parents were married. Looking from the outside, it was a normal middle class family. Anna's childhood was inconspicuous. However, she had always wanted to be a boy. When she was in kindergarten and about three or four years old, she already wanted to be a boy. Her female body developed normally during puberty. In hindsight, she says about her puberty, during my years of adolescence, I frequently asked myself who or what I actually was. With regard to my gender identity, my being a woman, I did not have any guide except for my feelings, and my feelings told me I am a man. Actually, my body should be that of a man. That pressure inside of me, the desire to no longer be a woman, became increasingly unbearable. I often longed to die. After finishing school and a professional education, Anna worked as a musician in a band where she increasingly presented herself as a man. She took on a male first name which was completely accepted by her friends. She had several sexual relationships with women all of which ended in a very painful breakup. At the age of 25, Anna entered therapy with a female doctor who was a psychiatrist and psychotherapist. A few months later, Anna began with testosterone injections, the male sex hormone, and soon after that, she presented herself to a leading expert in Western Europe on transgender issues. His diagnosis was Anna is transsexual. Three professionals, all of whom were psychiatrists and psychotherapists, confirmed 
in six expert assessments that Anna is transsexual. The psychological difficulties Anna had during her puberty, some of which she was able to tell her specialists about, for example, her constant wish to die, her suicidal thoughts, were attributed to the circumstance that Anna was suffering from gender dysphoria. She was suffering from her persistent feeling of living in the wrong body, and the treatment for this was a so-called sex change. In the specialist's reports, it says that they had found nothing out of the ordinary, neither in Anna's childhood nor in her overall mental condition. In one of the reports, it says that Anna, quote, gives a firm and convincing impression in her self-expression as a man. Soon, a male first name was entered into Anna's passport, and shortly after that, Anna had her so-called sex reassignment surgeries, that is the removal of her breasts, her uterus, and her ovaries. About her therapy before she went on to surgeries, Anna says in hindsight, the therapist didn't get a single word out of me. I was silent. I did not know what to say. I was suffering quietly within myself. I had no words for my suffering, no language. What did I want? I did not know. I was simply convinced that I was a man in the wrong body. The psychological difficulties were so deep within me, one does not want to address those inner conflicts because there's no one to offer an alternative perspective such as maybe there is an option other than hormones and surgery. And what lies underneath the surface is so terrible one doesn't want to look at it. Six months after her surgeries, Anna became a Christian, and she also made a decision, and she wrote down, I made a decision to refrain from, from flirting and sexual behavior. I am aware that in doing so, I will have to do without a certain kind of attention, but otherwise I can't be open to anything new in my life, whatever that might be. Anya, Anna continued to tell me, one day, during a quiet time of prayer, a thought came to me, and I asked myself how God created me, whether he made me a woman or a man. In that moment, I knew deep inside myself that I was a woman. But the thought was still too difficult for me. I needed another entire year before I could make the decision, yes, I want to live as a woman again. It was the most difficult decision in my life. The thought of facing my parents as a woman was almost unbearable. I felt so ashamed. In order to be able to go on her path of change, Anna moved to another geographical location where she had found desperately needed new resources. She found a new therapist, a man who worked with transactional analysis and did a lot of inner child work with her. She found a female pastoral advisor to whom she could gradually open up and very important too, she found new Christian friends. Anna says in hindsight, when I told my therapist before the surgeries that everything was fine with me and my family, I was convinced of that. In reality, my inner wounds, my inner terror and pain were so huge that I had completely suppressed them. I had to suppress them in order to survive. The detransitioning process of Anna took about six years and it was another four years before she could say that she really enjoys being a woman. Gradually, step by step, she could face her inner wounds. Some quotes from Anna. I had to learn that my wounds were a reality, that they were true. I had to feel the pain and deprivation and I had to learn to cry. I had to mourn the things that never were. I had to learn to give room for my anger against so many unfair and painful things in my life. 
When I learned to express my buried anger, it became an important means of strength to escape from the prison that had always prevented me from showing myself, my real self, to the world. About her childhood, Anna says in hindsight, my childhood was filled with shame, fear, and insecurity. A typical situation, I recall, my mother and I were in a department store. I must have been seven or eight years old. I was running around among the clothes racks until my mother called me Anna. When I heard my name, I felt tremendous shame. A few more quotes from her. Looking back at my childhood, I have a picture in my mind. I am lying on the diaper changing table and my mother is looking at me with love. But in the next moment, all of a sudden, she looks at me in a powerful, aggressive manner like a wolf with her hair standing on end. I am full of fear and terror. To me, my mother was like a monster, unpredictable and destructive. I always longed for her, but it was dangerous to approach her. The atmosphere around her was characterized by aggressiveness. She would slap me in the face without any reason at all. At some point, I started to duck when she would just as much as raise an arm. The atmosphere at home was always tense. It is true, I never wanted to be a girl. I always wanted to be a boy. But in reality, I never wanted to be at all. My main conflicts were, I am not right. I must not show myself. I am drowning in shame. Regrettably, Anna's father was no support for Anna's development either. Anna describes him as a sexually addicted man. Anna says today, my father was surrounded by a sexualized atmosphere. I have often asked myself if there was any sexual abuse at a very early point in my life, but I have no evidence of that. The sexualized atmosphere Anna's father spread certainly contributed to the shame Anna felt about herself. She never felt at ease in his arms. When Anna was 12 years old, there was a sexual assault on her by her father, a clearly inappropriate touching, but it was a single event. Anna says, neither my father nor my mother were able to do anything to affirm me as a person. From my father, I got the message that women are worthless. For more than 15 years during my childhood, I suffered from the same horrible nightmares. As a child and an adolescent, I would often sit in my room and cry. I did not know why. For many years, Anna was haunted by thoughts of suicide. She had a strong compulsion towards self-destruction. Can we please see the picture, the next one? Anna had a strong compulsion towards self-destruction, as we can see in this picture. Anna drew it during her journey of detransitioning. Anna is drowning, you can see the real Anna down there, is drowning in a swamp. And the name of the swamp, the words around it in German, they say, not being, hatred, no love, death, not being wanted, shame, despised, filth, swamp. The figure above is most likely a part in Anna herself and reflects her compulsion towards self-destruction, but it's also an indication for her deep attachment trauma. What helped Anna on her journey? A few glimpses. Also, again, quotes from her. It took me a long time to build trust, to not always have to be nice, but to be authentic, to have the courage for a dispute and an open conflict, to catch up in the development of my emotional intelligence, to accept help, to become more and more honest, to be able one day 
to tell someone about my deepest feelings and to have the experience that when I say something, no matter what, I am taken seriously and I am not judged or condemned. One day again, I felt tremendous pain welling up inside me about my mother. It was so painful that I just screamed and screamed. I was with a friend, she was very motherly. She had to close the window so that no one would hear me screaming. While I was experiencing this incredible pain, she took me in her arms and I felt I am not alone. Somebody understands me. Somebody holds me. I can now allow myself to feel the pain and accept it. There was comfort and healing in that. What Anna experienced was, I am being held. I am allowed to be. Especially through therapy, Anna learned to feel feelings like shame, anger, pain, sadness, fear, helplessness, self-hatred, abandonment, and deep loneliness. However, those feelings then welled up in her so massively that she became depressed and more than once did not want to go on living. She therefore decided to spend six weeks in a psychiatric hospital where they offered body-oriented therapy. There she lost her fear of her emotions. Today she says, I can cope with what I feel inside of me. One experience from her hospital time, a quote again from her. During one of the therapeutic exercises, I saw a picture in my mind. There was a trash can, and I had been thrown into that. In the therapeutic session, I literally climbed out of that trash can and made a renewed decision to live my life. I said aloud, I am Anna, and this time I am going to stay here. This ability to let myself be seen was a prerequisite for my ability to receive, to receive more love from other people and from God. About six years into her journey, Anna applied for the official restitution of her female first name so that her girl's name would be back in her passport. The same transgender specialist whose assessment had led her the way to sex reassignment surgery now issued a report for her so that Anna could have her girl's name, which reflected her true self, back in her official papers. In the conversation with Anna, he admitted, I have never met anyone who was really happy after the surgeries. And Anna adds, it's a deceptive package because my problems had not been solved. Today, about 10 years later, Anna says, I don't suffer anymore. I like to be a woman. I don't have to wait anymore for anybody to give me permission to be. I am who I am. Some general considerations. There's no evidence that transsexual feelings are inborn or genetically determined. And there are also no brain studies that would support this idea. The prominent American researchers, Maya and McHugh, summarized the current research in these words. The hypothesis that gender identity is an innate fixed property of human beings that's independent of biological sex, that a person might be a man trapped in a woman's body or a woman trapped in a man's body is not supported by scientific evidence. Anna was a deeply traumatized woman. Besides her difficult and probably traumatic relationship with her father, she suffered from an attachment trauma, an early relational trauma in the relationship with her mother. We know from infant research that the mother's face is the most potent visual stimulus in the child's world, especially during infancy. It is well known that direct gaze can me mediate not only loving but also powerful, aggressive messages. This is extremely traumatizing for a small child. The image of the aggressive face as well as the infant's bodily reaction to it are stored in the autobiographical memory. 
It's important to note, however, that this was not the mother's fault. From all what we know, Anna's mother was a deeply traumatized woman herself. She probably suffered from an undiagnosed personality disorder. Anna once said, I see a picture in my mind. It's a house which is burning on the inside. It's not burning on the outside, only on the inside. I step into this house and I'm standing in the midst of the harsh flames. Actually, one would normally think I would have to scream like hell, but I don't feel anything at all. I'm very sad that I do not feel anything and that I'm not able to get out of myself. This is an inner picture of overwhelming stress. When an infant experiences overwhelming stress, it experiences frantic distress and reacts with panic, fear, terror, fear of death, and then dissociation, which is no feelings anymore. Usually those experiences are not a one-time event, but are chronic and cumulative. Under overwhelming stress, an infant cannot develop a secure sense of self, maybe no sense of self at all. The leading American brain researcher, psychiatrist, and expert in attachment theory, Alan Shaw, writes, traumatic attachment experiences in the first two years of life negatively impact brain development and negatively impact the child's sense of self. It may even produce deficits in identifying a corporeal image of self. Anna's name, as we have seen in the picture, was synonymous for her with annihilation, with destruction of the person she was. The wish to be a boy may have well been a defense against this feeling of fear terror, of fear of death, of not being allowed to be, of not being allowed to develop her real self. Anna once said, I'm a free floating in space. I'm free floating in space with no foothold, no ground beneath my feet, no security. Fortunately, that all changed. Today, Anna says, maybe some people think the diagnosis transsexuality was wrong. However, it was not wrong. I was transsexual. It was just that there was something else lying deep beneath this surface. I would like to present the second case now before I come again to some general considerations. Uh, the second person, Kathy, again, not her real name, asked that her story will not be recorded, will not be filmed, and of course we do respect that, so please can we switch off the filming. The pioneer in attachment theory, John Bowlby, wrote, what is believed to be essential for mental health is that the infant and young child should experience a warm, intimate and continuous relationship with his mother, in which both find satisfaction and enjoyment. Alan Shaw, I mentioned him already, the leading brain researcher, psychiatrist and attachment experts, with regard to, trans, to gender confusion and transgenderism, he says, we understand failure at gender acquisition to be rooted in the attachment dynamic. Sorry, that's the next one. To be rooted in the attachment dynamic between the mother and baby. A child can find I'm sorry, let me just see. A child can find its foundational yes to self-being only within a relationship. And this self that the child finds is always a gendered self. It's never neutral, it's always a male or a female self. Anna and Kathy both had severe attachment traumata from their very first and for the development of their sense of self, decisive relationship with their mother. It was not the fault of Kathy's mother either. Kathy's mother was young and she just did what she was recommended to her, 
with regard to infant care and what she probably had experienced herself during her own infancy. Kathy was exposed to recurrent episodes of unpredictable, overwhelming stress by being left alone in her buggy for many hours every day. Infant research teaches us when a baby wakes up from sleep, is hungry or feels uncomfortable or something frightens or alarms the baby, the child starts crying. If nobody comes to calm or to comfort the baby, the situation escalates. The child builds itself up to a frantic distress, panic, fear, fear terror, fear of death, freezing of the body. Neurophysiologically, neurophysiologically this is mediated by a hyperarousal of the sympathetic nervous system and may be seen in the child's face as wild fear. If still nobody comes to rescue the child, a parasympathetic hyperarousal will dominate. The infant may lose postural control. There may be an atony of the body. The child withdraws from the outer world. Dissociation sets in. Dissociation means no feeling anymore. Everything is numb. Dissociation is a defense to order in order to cope with overwhelming stress it's the so-called ultimate survival strategy. Alan Shaw writes, it's a summary, not a direct quote. In hopeless and stressful situations, the parasympathetic nervous system leads to a passive disengagement in order to conserve the last energies, to foster survival, to feign death, in order to allow restitution of the absolutely deplu depleted bodily and mental resources. Both Anna and Kathy experienced this threat of death, this threat of annihilation. Anna once said, in the end, my soul was only a little speck. Attachment trauma during the first two years of life is usually cumulative and chronic and without experiences of attachment repair. It leaves the child in an intensely disruptive psychobiological state that's beyond the infant's immature coping strategies. Psychophysiological, that is psychobiological factors in a child certainly do play a role too. Some children are born with smaller stress coping abilities. Some experience stress already prenatally. Some children are more robust in their nature. Others are more sensitive and more vulnerable. So the nature of a child in this attachment trauma does play a role. However, according to Alan Shaw, attachment trauma can be so severe that it may override any psychophysiological or other resilience factors. And the last quote by Alan Shaw, traumatic attachment experiences negatively impact the early organization of the right brain and thereby produce deficits in its adaptive functions of emotionally understanding and reacting to bodily and environmental stimuli, identifying corporeal image of self and its relation to the environment, distinguishing the self from the other, and generating self-awareness. And the uh, emphasis is added by me. Under overwhelming stress, again, an infant cannot develop a secure sense of self, maybe no sense of self at all. It may even produce deficits in identifying a corporeal image of self. Anna and Kathy were both left with utter confusion about who they were, and I believe that their relational trauma played a crucial role in this. I cannot say that this trauma model fits for everyone with a transgender issue, but it may fit for more than we may think. Anna's and Kathy's stories give tremendous hope. Even in adulthood, in some cases, it's possible to embark on a gradual change process. Their stories also shed light on possible preventive measures. 
and maybe more people than we think can go on such a journey if we all, professionals and non-professionals alike, give more support, speak the truth, and give more love and care. Thank you. <laughs>